Well, thank you, Ronnie. And uh, I'm excited about both the presenters. I uh, have known Ryan for quite some time. And Ryan, for those of you who have not read the the sheet here, she is the digital media strategy manager at the California State Lottery. And when we were talking about um, this particular program, in particular, the whole point was to have a strategist with an overarching understanding of social media marketing and really about laying the groundwork of full comprehensive strategy and then the analytics that are available for us to monitor the success. And then how do you use it? Not just the tools and not just what the information is, but once you have the information, what do you do with it to make your execution better? And she is fresh off the launch of Powerball and has some learnings that she will share with you. Uh, today, so I'm very excited and thank you for joining us today. And our second presenter I uh, met in January. He's with Viral Heat, uh, uh, John Boytnot, and I, in 15 seconds, uh, nicknamed him Widget Boy because um, I. Uh, and fascinated by the technology tool that he has. And it is uh, a dream of mine to get out of the consulting business and, and come up with a, a tool, a, t a, a packageable thing, a, a widget, if you will. And Viral Heat is a platform that has very uh, sophisticated analytics. And it's about what it can measure, and then again, uh, bringing it back to what do you do with it. And uh, you did not hear, come to hear me talk about these great presenters. Instead, I want to turn it over uh, to Ryan petit Frere okay. for uh, setting it up and setting up social analytics. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? OK, I can, I've got a voice, so I can project if I need to. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Uh, when Shelly first asked me to join uh, the SAC Social Media Club, well, whenever Shelly asks me to do anything, I do it, one. Um, <laughs> but uh, when she first asked me to join and to uh, present this, I was uh, very excited to kind of talk about this next phase of social media marketing. We awful, often talk about um, how you get started and what you do in the process, but you know the, the analysis part also often gets kind of left behind in time, other priorities, upcoming projects. So uh, this is probably the most valuable piece of a great social media strategy. And so I was excited to be able to uh, sit with an audience that is kind of already thinking about what they can do with their analytics. Um, but before we get started, I was really interested in learning more about you guys. Uh, as you guys know from uh, marketing yourselves, it's all about your audience, and you really want to tailor your content to your audience. So that's a little bit of the objective today, is to t tailor today's um, content to your, to your needs. So of the people here, how many of you guys uh, represent like a small business? Quite a bit. Mid to large size business? I'm one of those. We have about 600 employees at the California Lottery statewide. Any nonprofits here? Okay, quite a bit. And any like independent consultants, I guess this falls under small businesses, but people working for themselves, really okay. Yes, that's awesome. Um, of the people here, um, wanna talk about communication channels. Who has a website? Everyone, just about everyone. Who's using email as a, as a communication channel? SMS marketing, text? Okay, a little bit, I see that. <laughs> social media? Everyone, okay. We're gonna dive into social media just a little bit more. Who here is using Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, LinkedIn, Tumblr, Dig? OK, there are too many. <laughs> there are a lot. Um, and then in terms of your audience, are you guys speaking to consumers, other businesses? OK, is the function e-commerce based? Influence? OK, Inf there's a lot of influence, actually. That's more than I expected. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about me uh, as a representative of the California Lottery. We have about 600 employees. Uh, we are a B2B and B2C business. Uh, we obviously sell to all 18 year old, 18 and older Californians in the state. 
um, our lottery products. You're probably familiar with Powerball, which is our most recent, but we have scratchers and draw products. Um, and then additionally, we uh, also, though, sell to businesses. Uh, we have a lot, it might be surprising here that we have only 600 employees. That's because most of the business, we are franchisees. So most of the businesses that we work with um, are franchised and not counted in our number. So we're also B2C because we're always trying to bring on more people as well. Um, we're obviously not e-commerce based yet. We're looking at that as something in the future. Um, but uh, so most of our function is about really brand branding our branding ourselves, building loyalty and affinity, and really, really um, uh, dealing with uh, consumer perception. We are a state agency, which means we are tied to state government. We are not an independent private business. So when we get into sentiment, it'll be a very interesting conversation. Uh, it always gets a little spicy in the political realm about where our money goes and what we do with it. <coughs> so, you know, I kind of just wanted to, before we can jump into to analytics, you kind of got to start with the, the process. This is a process. Um, you can't just jump into analytics right away. Um, so I kind of thought I'd just kind of throw out uh, a little bit of my strategic planning process, and I hope it's kind of similar to yours. You might have different words or things that you use here. Um, pretty, getting a pretty good sense from the raise, the raise of hands, as you guys are far into this, so I don't need to, to delve too much into it. But um, this was like the initial process for us. We really kind of came in, and I've been at the lottery now just rounding a year. Um, and when we started with social media, we weren't, we were, it was a thing that people would do for fun. There wasn't a strategic effort behind it. It was a kind of a way to kill time. Um, it, they really didn't have a purpose uh, in our overall business plan. Uh, and so that's changed quite a bit. And when we came in, the first thing we really needed to do is to do an assessment uh, of what our needs were, what our objectives were, what we were doing, who we were connecting with. Um, sentiment was a big piece there. Um, and then we developed a strategy, which was really based off of our overall business strategy, right? Um, you know, I often have people in my organization, a lot of our leadership come in and say, hey, all of the kids are on Instagram, all of the kids are on Pinterest, we gotta be there. And it's always a constant battle to communicate that it's not about uh, the, ne the next shiny object, that it has to have uh, a foundation in what our overall strategic business plan is. So it really started with looking at the, uh, the strategy and then developing a, a social media strategy from there. Once the SAD strategy was developed that, that worked in conjunction uh, with multiple um, 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 divisions of our organization, I really need to kind of pitch it to the top and get our director to sign off on it, uh, which is always a challenge. I don't know, has anyone ever, has anyone ever had to go through the process of getting sign off or was it always, an, who here has had, a, had easy sailing in getting sign off from the top for investing in social media, conducting social media? We got one guy. That's actually fantastic, <laughs> too, too. Um, so that's, we're all kind of in the same boat here. It's a common, common conversation point. Uh, but, but getting some bit of buy off at the top for resources and things like that, that is actually still an ongoing battle, um, especially with today, with the economic climate that we're in right now and the fact that we're a state agency and everything needs to be tied to some level of ROI, improving ROI, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, and then essentially preparing our resources and preparing to actually implement the strategy. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about tools today. Um, and then the implementation of the plan, which is exactly where we are right now. Uh, we're deep into the implementation of our social media strategy and we're actually going through our first round of optimization. Um, so when you look at this, it kind of looks like a lot of stuff to begin with, but the strategy gets much easier moving on. Once we get through this, this seven step process, it really turns into a three step process and it's optimizing. It's coming up with new ideas, testing them and optimizing. Coming up with new ideas, testing them and optimizing and overall repeating what works. I think you guys are all probably doing a similar strategy. So there's a statistic out there that says only about 20% of marketers measure and utilize uh, social media data. Um, and some of the reasons that is is because their objectives are a little bit unclear, right? We don't know exactly how this fits. There's so much out there. We don't know exactly how this fits into our organization. There's so many different places within the organization that social media could be a benefit. Um, there's so many things with the internet in general that you can measure. Click-through rate, likes, which I call fans in general. I don't know why they stopped calling them fans, but likes, um, virality, uh, retweets, sentiment. It goes on and on. There's a lot to measure. Um, and if you're thinking from an organizational perspective and you're talking about customer service, then there's cu customer service analytics, PR analytics, marketing analytics, IT analytics, and it goes on and on and on and on. Um, and so with all of that stuff in the fray, uh, it's really difficult to measure ROI in general. As I mentioned, a lot of types of social media out there, a lot of social networks out there. It's really important to focus. 
figure out what's important to start with the business strategy. Determine what to what, determine your scope and which organizations or which divisions you're actually going to are gonna you're actually going to work with. Does any how many people have used social media in a multi-divisional function? It's not just a customer service tool, it's a PR tool, or are people using it very poignantly for marketing? Pointed. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can see this, it came out kind of blurry. I borrowed this slide. Um, so I, we kind of touched on this already, but it always, social media marketing, right? Everyone wants to start here. Tools, it's always about tools. I don't know why this always begins the conversation, but we always go to tools and always run us to um, looking at the next shiny object when everything starts at the business goals. I like that slide for that reason. I've gone through um, some of the scope. Um, and then setting social media goals. I'm gonna give you a more overall um, case study of what we did for Lottery after I kind of set up just the strategy, the framework in general. Um, but after you determine what the business goals are, you really wanna look into the purpose of each social media site. They all have different functions. We at the Lottery utilize uh, YouTube primarily right now um, to, for our mission is message messaging. Uh, we spend a lot of time trying to communicate our, that the, the money that we generate goes to uh, schools. And because that's often a difficult conversation and our players truly don't, uh, <laughs> they're not as married to that as a concept. They play because they wanna win. They don't play because they want to contribute money to education. That's always been a struggle for us as a communications point. So as you know, Video is the most viral piece of content that exists on the internet. So our entire uh, YouTube strategy is really to push our hardest communication, our most difficult communication piece, which is integrity and uh, where the money goes, the money going to education. Um, we also then need to, uh, we've defined our KPIs and I'll kind of go into the three areas that we're best utilizing, mark, uh, utilizing social media. As I said, in marketing, PR. We also use it in customer service. And then we've developed a number of tactics and I'll kind of give you some case studies on that and what we've done to um, move the needle uh, in those areas. So I really like this quote, um, and this is from Oliver Blanchard, and it says, ROI can only be calculated after the investment has yielded a return. It cannot and must not be estimated beyond, beforehand, ever, under any circumstances. And what this means to me is essentially that before you, this is a great communication point for me because before I can, ex I can be expected to show value in social, I need to have, I need to have the buy-off. I need to have some resources to show you what we can do. I essentially need to set a baseline, right? Set a baseline in, in um, the tactics that we've tried and what that's delivered to us. Um, so usually when people are thinking about building their strategy, you usually go um, goals, objectives, strategies, and tactics. And objectives are usually tied to some sort of number. They're numerically based. So for example, if you're using social media for customer service, we want to reduce the wait time uh, from a, a 48 hour period to a 24 hour period. Um, when I came into the lottery, we really just wanted to set a baseline. So I wasn't able to estimate what ROI would be, which is often a question, what am I gonna get out of this? If I'm gonna give, I'm building a strategic plan, what am I gonna get out of this? What are you expecting? And I've been able to build a culture of understanding that I'm not going to be able to give you ROI until I have a baseline of research to start on. I think this is a really funny slide. Uh, this kind of is indicative of the, the quote, but it kind of says, you see here this, the sales slide, and it says actual, and then the forecast. You know, you always, of course you're always gonna forecast positive. And then it says, okay, but what if our video doesn't go viral? So that's kind of the, the standpoint I come from is, I can't tell you right now, I can tell you where I'd like to be. You know, I can tell you where I'd like, how many fans I'd like to have if you give me $10,000 or $20,000. I can tell you where I'd like to be in terms of cutting down on our customer wait time. I could like to tell you where I'd like to be in terms of sentiment, but I don't know how my, my content is going to perform on the web until I have a baseline to start with. <coughs> um, in terms of proving value, a lot of the reason that we use analytics is to prove value, to make cases for budget or to make cases for continuing the pro programs. Um, and it's always a challenge And how do you show value in social media if you're not an e-commerce e based type business, right? Or if you're a um, nonprofit, for example, and you're really focusing on influence, um, how do you show some sort of ROI with value? So there are a couple of ways that we, uh, I kind of look at it, um, and it's really about doing a cost benefit analysis um, and estimating what the cost would have been if we hadn't moved forward with the uh, tactics that we've used. Here's some great examples here. There's a cost to labor, there's a cost for tools, opportunity cost, training and risks, but there's a lot of benefit too. And so in terms of tying value to that, um, 
I really spent a lot of time on trying to estimate some amount that it would take to drive awareness, uh, some amount that it would take to drive uh, web traffic, sales, things of that sort. I do have a little bit of data. I'm, I'm blessed enough that we have a, a number of research uh, vendors that work with us, so I'm able to actually give a number on what our digital spend is. Um, so in the sales perspective, I, it works out fairly well. For every dollar that we invest in digital, we receive about a $7 return, whereas every dollar that we invest in television and radio, we see anywhere between a 3 to a $10 return. Uh, and then anything out of home usually ranks around a $3 return. So in terms of showing a benefit and cost uh, on the sales side, that's, that's fairly easy. Um, talk about a little bit a little later about the conversion rates that we see and the tools that we use to track those. We particularly use Shoutlet and have recently done a five bid looking at a number of tools. We're going to hear all about Viral Heat and how great that is. Uh, but we'll also talk about some other vendors out there that do some really, really great um, analytics, um, analytics, um, um, I don't want to say projecting, but they're, they're able to prove ROI in a number of ways. I was trying to think of a way to put, sum up Adobe Social in a sound bite, but I couldn't. <laughs> okay. Uh, as I said, so three ways to add value. Grow revenue, obviously, if you're e-commerce based, it's fairly easy. Reduce cost. Um, there's the other one, and improve, improve satisfaction, which is easy to test when you use sediment. So here are some metrics, right? You want to, every business is different. I, I can't stand here and tell you what works for the lottery works directly for you. It really base, it's really based on your organization. It's very unique to your organization. So I thought I would throw up a number of types um, of KPIs where you can add value under these three categories, growing revenue, reducing cost, improve satisfaction. I have a tendency to talk really fast. Am I talking really fast? Yes. OK. That happens. And I talk a lot, too. So I'm going to slow it down a little bit. <laughs> um, so in terms of growing revenue, how many of you guys, again, are e-commerce based? Anyone selling anything online? Two. Wow, not a lot. Um, in my personal opinion, um, this is the easiest way to show ROI if you're fundraising. Great example, the Obama campaigns were both phen phenomenal examples. Um, uh, if you are selling product online, these are just some major KPIs. Leads, conversion rates from platform to platform, uh, from your social sites to your, uh, to your website to the actual customer flow. We, have a, we use a thing called customer flow where we take them through a specific journey um, from page to page to page and try to build brand loyalty. So when people land, um, when people, if we work on e-commerce based, right now we are, we're not, but if we work on e-commerce based, when people land on the site, we do an introduction that's an engagement piece on our first page if you were to get there from a social site. Um, we, and I'll show you some examples. We have a campaign going right now. Uh, but we really just want to build a relationship with them first, first space before we get to the home run. Uh, and then we start to talk a little bit more about the product with some more interactive elements. And then we try to convert them to a more sales-based page, which in our case, since we're not e-commerce based, um, a retail locator tool is the representative of that. Um, so that's kind of how we track how we're generating leads from social and then driving them to something that has some level of, of, of value. And I, I want to make sure I articulated that well enough. Um, because we're not e-commerce based, I've had to find a solution by determining what the most valuable page of real estate on our public website is. And that's the site, that's the page that drives traffic into retail, and that's our retail locator tool. So the usage of that tool and the frequency of usage of that tool and the consumer journey people take online to get to that page is how I represent ROI from a sales perspective. Um, percentage of new customers for other businesses, percentage of repeat customers, we're actually unable to track that, um, and then the number of conversions. And conversions, as I hope you guys know, are any action someone takes that you have tried to in incent them to take. So whether that's clicking on a specific link, purchasing a product, reading a white paper, whatever action you're trying to get them to take. Um, just a couple of examples there. Another way to add value. Um, in our ongoing effort to prove that what we do is valuable, what we do is going to move the, move the needle, is to reduce costs. And I think that all types of social media marketing have benefit here, regardless of the industry that you work in. Um, so great examples are the number of website visits. Um, we've actually, since we've started our social media strategy, have in, increased our website visits by 30%. Um, online mentions, numbers of articles, social PR, um, and that can be tracked both um, with online tools, we use a Nielsen tool, uh, but we can also we also use that with Twitter. 
And then uh, user generated content and user shared content, both things. What types of people, how many people are creating content? How many, type, how many people are taking pictures of their scratchers and they're winning scratchers and sending it to us? How many people are showing us pictures of their retail location? How many pe people are sending us pictures of um, um, their winning face when they're prompted? And at the same time, how is our content being shared amongst our networks and how far in terms of virality is that spreading? Um, all the other ways to reduce costs, the load that we put on customer service is another big piece for us. Web self-service, we utilize social media as a customer service tool. Um, we have yet to be able to track traffic, uh, reduction in customer service traffic because our phone lines are always busy <laughs> at all times. But we do know for a fact that we do provide uh, a lot of extra customer service support. On the weekends, we had to do a nine to five, and then from five, five on to the end of the day, and Saturday and Sunday, uh, there is no customer service. Um, there's no customer service from the lottery, except for on social media. So we probably take an easy, easy amount of about 50, 50, 50 to 55 um, questions on social media a day. So we've been able to prove value there. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to tie a dollar amount to that, but customer satisfaction is still very important. And I can tie the time that it would take to answer those to the cost of a person in that unit. Um, and then required staff to customer ratio. And then satisfaction. Um, how happy are our people? Um, are they finding what they need? Um, we do a lot by way of um, paid research. Um, we outsource a lot of research, but um, social media has become a tool to get a little bit of insight, an immediate insight from what our, how our consumers feel about campaigns, products, um, and we've actually made some changes and tweaks to our marketing plans as a result of putting our feelers out to our groups um, and our social media groups and getting feedback. I don't know if anyone is familiar with the case study about the gap when they were going to change their logo. And they, I see some heads nodding. And they put it out on social media. I still don't know to this day if that was actually a hoax or not, but as the story goes, uh, because of the negative feedback they'd received, they actually s did not move forward with a logo change and maintained their standard and, and tried and true uh, logo as a result of the social media feedback. So it is a great way to get instant um, feedback from your consumers uh, without having to spend a lot of money on research. We actually spend a good uh, anywhere between 10 to 50 uh, on a per research, per Thing that we're researching, whether that's a product, uh, an attitude. Um, so when we're able to get just a little bit of insight, and if it's really, really strong, it's incredibly valuable. You can tie thousands of dollars to that. Um, average percentage of star rating, if you have uh, rating capabilities on um, customer satisfaction score, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, you can also ask for, you know, for surveys and uh, feedback to see if people have found the information or the product that they're looking for. Um, again, going into surveys, the likelihood to recommend, and then re repeat bit visits. Um, I kind of want to speak to um, the repeat visits that we get on our social sites a little bit. Um, because when we first started, we no never did any paid social media marketing. We never did pay promoted page posts. We never, never did premium page posts. Um, and so the traffic that we got in um, was actually very pure. People were looking for us and finding us, and uh, we had a lot of repeat visits because people were seeking us out. Those numbers have drastically skewed now that we've invested a lot in social media marketing. We are reaching a, casting a broader net, and as a result, um, we have a lot of visits. Our visits are very high, but repeat visits on, as a percentage of our traffic is, overall is down. So it's always uh, important to kind of put your data in context. Um, especially to the people that you need to justify spend to. So I just kind of wanted to set up the framework a little bit and just talk about how you build the strategy, talk about um, a little bit of the things that we're doing. I wanted to dive into tool usage a little bit, but um, as I said, only 20% of marketers use social media ROI. That's a, a little stat from eMarketer from a while ago, but uh, I want to encourage you, if you're not doing it yet, that you can do it. And when we, after we go through the tool usage, I'd like to kind of go a little bit more into Powerball and learn a little bit more about um, what specific things you guys are measuring. And I can tell you, in our case, exactly what we're doing to, uh, to, to pivot. That's it for now. That's a pause. <laughs> we're going to transition. I'll be back. Oh, it's my turn? It's your turn. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I talk so fast. No, you didn't. <laughs> it's a good clip for, 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 for
Yep. And so, uh, <laughs> so we might, you know. Oh, I, don't I would love, I would love to kind of start um, a general discussion because I can, I, I really want to tailor it to the group, um, and I would, I would love to pull out case studies of what we've done on our paid owned side, um, and look at what kind of data you guys are using, so I can kind of compare and show you what we've done. And if you guys are looking at paid strategies as well, as opposed to just doing owned, um, can share some tactics based on the level of spend that you have as well. What's the difference between paid and owned? Um, by that? Sure. What, uh, what do you, what's that? So, owned, you know, we have owned media assets. When I say owned, it's anything that you're not investing dollars in. Usually, the biggest investment is staff resources. So, your email marketing, your email blast, your website, your website content, optimization of your website content, um, web optimization of, uh, you know, the images that you use and what you're actually publishing. Um, that doesn't touch our own. So, paid, you know, in our case, we do television, radio, out of home, we do events, fairs, and festivals. Um, and then we have, on occasion, have purchased some influencers, <laughs> and so I have a little bit of a thing on Mario Lopez set up before when we go through that. So the difference between paid and owned really is, uh, the, it really does, for us, come down to are we putting money there or not? Because it's a completely different strategy. It's completely, the expectation for what, for our paid media is vastly different than that of our owned. Own kind of gets to float away and do what it wants and just needs to come back. Uh, and show that it's doing something, but our paid uh, really needs to, to show a lot of value. And so uh, that's where the analytics come on board. But actually on the own side, you know, social media for us started off as an own channel and we uh, didn't invest a dollar in it. Um, and we did a number of guerrilla style promotions that were without tools, without promotional tools that were email based. I'll give you an example. The very first thing we did um, was a promotion where uh, we had this, this Lady Luck, she was dressed in all black, and we offered this beautiful incentive of, send us your picture of you dressed like Lady Luck, and you can win your picture on our cover photo for a week. And we got actually great, great response, and we had 12 people. They started sharing the content, putting in their own, we made a collage of them, we, they put their own images up on their cover photos, and that got a little bit of notice. Then we ran a photo submission campaign, completely email-based. Um, we asked people to send us pictures of their pets with holding a particular scratcher, which one, required them to go out and make a purchase. So I could actually prove purchase. I can actually tie a dollar amount to that for a $5 scratcher. And then two, um, I was able to track uh, how many unique people I was, I was able to um, engage. And then what, because it was email based, how many of those people are part of our, our loyalty program. And in that case, we were able to bring in about 30% of those people were not, not part of our loyalty program at all. And we utilized those emails to return, as re for return marketing campaigns. So getting back to your question of what is paid and owned. Oh, yes. What I was getting, what, what I was, what I was getting at is um, social turned in, turned from owned to paid as a result of doing a number of guerrilla style marketing campaigns that were a lot of hard work. But because I was able to de deliver analytics and provide a plan on how to utilize them, it very quickly turned into a paid, paid channel for us. So I can share some case studies on how we were able to do that. Great. As well. Thank you very much. And we're going to go really from case study right into tools and then... Although I end with a case study. And, and then we're going to go back to case studies. So we're going to go in and out. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So um, that's me. I'm probably sick of seeing that at this point. Um, okay. So just a little background on me. Wasn't sure how much to show. So I just sort of ends up being kind of a LinkedIn thing. So I'll kind of go through it briefly. Uh, Radio TV, I actually worked with Edie Lambert. Maybe some of that name rings a bell. I was an intern and I, I did a teleprompter for her like in 1994 and 1995 down in Santa Barbara. So I was in TV for 15 years all the way up until, um, all the way up until just like uh, three or four years ago. Um, and in my last couple of years working in a TV station, I sort of discovered social media and that it could bring traffic. So I come from a very sort of bring traffic to whatever it is. Uh, point of view and working in agencies and, and tools that measure the traffic that gets brought in and things like that. So, um, yeah, so I worked at NBC Bay Area. That's when I first started. Uh, I've sort of discovered ways on, I mean, the big thing that they needed at NBC Bay Area, Bay Area was to uh, get, get us traffic, right? So, uh, looked for ways to do that, whether it be Fark or Drudge or these other websites and then social bookmarking sites like Dig, Reddit, StumbleUpon, Delicious, all these other things, some of which exist now, some of which don't. And uh, figured out that some of them bring a lot of traffic. So that was that. Um, ended up moving on and going to Village Voice, where I worked for a year and a half as a social media manager there, teaching people how to use their Twitter and their Facebook pretty well. That was 2009, 2010. So it was 
it's actually kind of a while ago now, and Twitter, Facebook were really the only channels that most people kind of were, were using, journalists were using at, at that point. I mean, there were others, but those were the two big ones, and now Google Plus has like moved into, although not, you know, not as big as those two, but it's in there. So um, then also uh, ran own agency consultancy, did that for a year at one point, and then um, BizDev at an infographic slash SEO slash viral marketing agency, and that was for about 20 months until I started at Viral Heat about uh, seven months ago now. Time is, is passing by very quickly. So um, I think that, you know, turn up the heat in social, I think that's obviously, you know, giving, you know, mentioning viral heat, and I think that's great. But I think what we mean by when we say turn up the heat in social, what does that mean? It's, so I think one of the problems that, that marketers uh, have, one of the confusion points that they have, if you will, is trying to figure out what exactly should I be looking at when I am looking at all the metrics and all the data and all those things. So I thought I would just throw out four or five things that you should want to try to take a look at. And yeah, I, I'll, I'll show it to you on Viral Heat, but again, the, I don't want it to be sort of a plug for Viral Heat. I'd love it if you take a look at Viral Heat, but there would be others. You would do yourself a disservice if you didn't check out others because they might fit better for whatever your needs are. Um, for instance, like Live Wire or Live Fire. I believe it is, it's owned by Google now, um, does mostly like contests and things like that, and we don't do that. So Wildfire, Wildfire? There you go, yeah. I mean, they were bought for 50 million, I should remember that, but whatever. Anyway, so yeah, they're a good one. So I mean, there's a lot of good ones, and I'll just sort of take you through a little brief demo of uh, the way you can get some of these, uh, the things that you should be looking out for and paying attention to as, met as metrics that you should want to try and utilize in order to get ROI. So, and like, why did I pick that, that graph right there, that pie graph? I don't know, it's just, it's mainly, it's interesting. I mean, this is actually measuring right here, um, the blue is Starbucks. So this is the total conversations that were happening on social media, on Twitter, uh, Pinterest, websites, YouTube, and Facebook. Um, and we're going to be adding Instagram soon. But just the total m number of mentions for all the different coffee industry keywords, the total number of mentions for Dunkin' Donuts keywords, how many times Dunkin' is measured, you know, is mentioned on Twitter, that kind of thing. And so Dunkin' isn't mentioned nearly as much as Starbucks. I mean, we know on the West Coast we don't really have much of Dunkin', so like half the country, there is no Dunkin'. So it really, it's like one-tenth of Starbucks. What's really interesting is that Starbucks mentions are really almost as big as coffee industry as a whole. Although I should say that that coffee industry section there doesn't include any Starbucks uh, mentions in it. So anyway, what, what's essentially happening there is a, is a keyword search, which is a monitoring tool, which some of you might be, some of you might know about. But basically, it's you, you want to search for some information about some of those things up there, about your brand uh, and, other, and other things. Um, and you're coming up with keyword searches. We're looking, you know, whatever tool it may be, is looking for them on social media, trying to find out all the different times that they've been mentioned on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, websites, YouTube, and others, and then throwing the data back at you, just plopping the data on you. Kind of, it seems like that. But I mean, the more time you spend with data, the less nasty it becomes. And some people are naturally gravitating towards data anyway with, with these tools. So it's just sort of figuring out which, uh, which one sort of works best for you. So anyway, what to look for a social media, yeah. So it better give you, a social media tool better give you some of these right here. I mean, there's, this is just, this isn't a huge list. This is just five that I'm going to quickly show you in the interest of time and, and attention span that I'm going to show you on viral heat to viral heat that would be job showing. Um, information about your brand. So I know some people who want to try and see what the, the conversations, you know, talking about their CEO, about themselves, about their own company, about their product, about their business, about their competitors, about their product and their business and all that. So that's one thing. Then there's sentiment. So how do people feel? And uh, Ryan mentioned this uh, to some degree already. Um, what's the emotional message of the different tweets and Facebook posts out there? So we, my tool actually uh, measures it for... Uh, the one that I work for actually measures it for uh, Twitter and Facebook. And we're going to be measuring it for Instagram. Basically, the way we do it is you get a, you get a small bit of text. We can, using natural language processing, we can look at the words in text, actually figure out whether or not there's a positive, negative, and neutral. Usually it's about 70% accurate because a lot of times, see, I'm talking way faster than you, way faster than you. You were like very measured, very, oh yeah, I think. Anyway, I tend, my personality is I tend to just go, 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 and then 15 minutes later say, any questions? And, and sometimes there isn't, sometimes there isn't. Anyway, where was I? Uh, so yeah, how do people, yeah, sentiment, how do people feel? It's about 70% accurate usually, and that is because of, you know, sometimes somebody will tweet something like, oh, I just went on a sick run, you know? Well, that's obviously bad, that's not a good thing. How could it be a good thing it has the word sick in it? And so the computer program takes a look at that and says, bad, you know, and, but the runner's like, but no, it's good. So one of the, the areas in the future where they're going to develop and make that better is by siloing it. So you'll have a health, 
silo and possibly a uh, extreme sports or a regular sports silo where the two things are different. So where sick will automatically very likely make it a negative potentially um, depending on the way it's used in the sentence and uh, the other would make it uh, you know, probably neutral or maybe, maybe even positive but still sick is a word that indicates sick usually even, yeah, it just depends because you might be talking about how sick you are when you try to go on a run or something. So it just depends on how it's used. And, and uh, so that, there's kind of an inherent flaw in computers trying to figure out what, uh, what your emotion is. And um, you, can, you can teach them to say, hey, no computer, that's incorrect. This one's positive, not negative. But uh, oftentimes, that, that's a slow process whereby those get better and new things get introduced. And so yeah, we've, we've got it at about 65 to 70% accuracy. But it is interesting. It is helpful. It does bring you in a direction that as long as you take it with a grain of salt, you're able to get some decent uh, information on it. So anyway, that a lot of the different sentiment analyses out there with the different tools have sort of a similar blind spot, if you will, in that way. Leads is another thing. Um, so in general, that, that deals with the whole getting to the whole conversions idea and really sort of trying to bring out ROI and social media. And so we actually have a leads category, a different, um, R2 actually has a, a different uh, API that takes a look at words, again, with natural language processing in tweets and in Facebook posts and determines whether or not there's indication language in there that they might want to buy something. So that's that. Then there's also influencers. Those are your marketers. Those are the people who are talking about you. Whatever tool you look at, you want to try and see if they somehow let who's talking about you the most. And out of the people who uh, which ones have influence. So those are two areas of influencers. And I can show you that. So I can show you a little bit about our analytics, but, but Ryan did a fantastic job with that. So um, let's escape out of there. And then I'm actually going to um, make that go smaller. And then, well, let's see what's the best way to get to that one right there. So this uh, is viral heat. Now I think I'm logged in in this one. Yeah, I am. So uh, this is a typical viral heat page right here. Uh, go to, uh, so this is a stream. Viral heat has streams. We show things in streams. I'm not going to explain too much of the tool because that would probably be evil. But um, the sources page here is where, with a tool like Viral Heat, a tool like Hootsuite, a tool, tool like SpreadFast, a tool like Sprinkler, a tool like uh, Radian 6, a tool like Lithium, a tool like all of these tools, and you probably heard some others with fancy names, the whole entire space is a big knockdown, drag out, cat fight, wild, wild west, uh, you know, wildfire being bought by Google, Radian being bought by Salesforce, Buddy being bought by Salesforce, all these different people, uh, you know. So, uh, be lying if I, I didn't say, hey, you know, it might be possible for us to be bought by somebody someday, and that could be exciting too, but who knows when that might happen. Regardless, um, so, oh, this is a page where you can add accounts, your Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google. So whatever tool you use, you might have to have a tool that lets you hook up your accounts and post from them all at once. We have that with the, with the publish box top right. And then you, you can do things like schedule, you can pick your accounts, you can make a group of people who can schedule, you can put rich text into it. You can do all sorts of different things. You can send it uh, just to Facebook, one particular country using Facebook. That kind of stuff. Um, the idea with that is it's something, it's something that you might find with like a Hootsuite or uh, in this case Viral Heat or um, Spreadfast is a good one. Sprout Social is a good one that a lot of people know about. Um, so these are all different. Uh, that's one thing that a lot of you are probably going to want, that general sort of publishing and sending stuff out, and also taking a look at different things like analytics right here. So if we click on analytics, um, and it takes a little bit to load, but if we click on analytics, it'll open up a analytics dashboard here, and any Facebook account that I have connected, I can actually click through and it'll give me, uh, it'll give me uh, Facebook analytics as well. Facebook can actually be like surprisingly difficult to deal with sometimes. It'll, it'll have outages and things like that. So they don't always have their act together and it makes us look bad. Like this missing four days right here. I talked to the engineer earlier today. Here, let's pull out 30 days. So there's a missing four days. And by the way, that 20, so this was like four days. How many days ago was that? That was 23. So they, number one, they only let you go back or they, they don't let you see the last three days. Facebook just does that as a policy. And then right here, these three days, so you see what happens. This, this is actually like a, a measurement of the growth of the fans of this Facebook page over time. And so yeah, we're missing, we're missing three days out of there and we're working to get it back, but it's actually uh, an issue, a bug with Facebook itself in this particular case. We've had our issues too, but this one's actually Facebook. And so there's like missing data there. You get location and demographics and this ties in directly to, um, 
to Facebook Insights. You can measure it over time. You can download a PDF report here. Um, but yes, I mean, that's, that's a typical idea of what, of what analytics are for us. But okay, so moving back up this list, I believe uh, one of the other ones here was, if I see it's, um, so let's talk about influencers. Here's how we get the influencers. You want to make sure whatever tool you use can give you something along those lines. So let me get back to you here. And let's go to sources here. So for a keyword search, where you're trying to figure out, you know, a subject that you're interested in, whether it's your CEO, that kind of stuff, you would want to try and get uh, information on, on uh, influencers. So let's actually go to Fitbit here, which some of you probably have one on you right now. Pretty popular um, uh, device that a lot of people use that you, measures your walking and your steps and all that stuff. Um, if I actually go, let me go back to sources here. Uh, this is actually all the most recent things that people have said about Fitbit. You can see some are negative and some other things like that, and I'll show you more on that in just a second. But um, if I go to Fitbit and I go to detailed analytics, then that's going to allow me to go to a place where I can actually look at influencers. So uh, this is a share of voice showing you which uh, platforms are talking about Fitbit the most. Twitter had 323 mentions on Friday out of a total of 350. But let's go, let's click through to the analytics here. And we also give an executive summary with a bunch of information on that. But clicking through to analytics, we'll actually go to Twitter at the top uh, once this loads right here. And there's a top influencers tab. And you can actually see uh, top influencers by volume right here. Um, so by number of tweets, that's what volume means. And again, with uh, uh, people who have a whole lot of followers, they may have mentioned one of your keywords just uh, once or maybe twice. possibly reach out to them and talk to them and engage with them, that kind of stuff. So this is where you get some actionable information. So whatever tool you use, you want to try and make sure, it, it's going to depend on, on what your business is and if, whether or not you need influencers, but they, they can make uh, good brand ambassadors, they can be good thought leaders in your subject area. You want to go find those thought leaders in your subject area. by, by and So what the, a system like this would do is whittle it down to the, the main people. And what, we, what we're able to do with this is we're able to take a look at the last day, the last seven days, the last 30 days, and you can see the influencers for each of those days. Are you taking questions from the floor or you want to hold them to the end? Uh, questions anytime. Um, I just wanted to know how you feel about the auto post and scheduling when we know it negatively affects edge rank. So if you are dealing with clients that have tens of thousands of lights, um, do you worry about that at all? Uh, a little bit. The same time, though, I've noticed that even when I just update Facebook, it, it isn't that much. Uh, th and that's just what I've noticed over a long period of time. It, it's actually gone up. You know, it, it's just, uh, it's up to you. You know, it's up to you. Um, we don't use those services. I've yeah. Twitter, and I manage about 12 different pages and on Facebook 15 directly. different Twitter accounts. And we do it all manually. Yeah. Because we don't want to have that health information compromised in any way out to the organization. We have other parts within Setter who do use Hootsuite, um, and they're looking into another tool, I think it's called Vocus, and yeah. we'll be going through that training, but our side will probably not be doing that, I just wondered if... Yeah, mixed feelings, you know, I mean, here I am, I work at a company, all I can do is just press forward and say, hey, it does this. You know, really, that's what it, it comes down to. My, my personal feelings are, um, actually, my personal feelings are, I, I kind of stopped giving a DAM in. You know, I, I, start, I stopped kind of caring about it, because um, I think the key thing is to just sort of continue, and to... Um, Engage, you know, talk with the people that you know and continue to have the friendships that you have and get new friendships, meet new people, and make that a part of your life if, if that's what you're you know, wanting to do. Um, so for me on a personal basis, that's sort of where I'm at. From a company standpoint, I've got to just sell what I've got to sell is more or less what that ends up being. Um, I've worked with, uh, it's natural for us social media people to get together online, and I have a good friend who um, does a number of the Phoenix campuses. She actually runs all their social media. Wondered if you know that seems to be. It's kind of it's kind of at the point where you just sort of develop your own style, and your your own style doesn't always uh, mean that it's going to go viral. It doesn't always mean that it's going. That that was particularly tough for me as somebody who who got things on the front page of Dig on a regular basis, and that meant twenty thousand. So nothing really goes. Understood. Except yeah. A, a well, so then, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would say do whatever. It's not exactly the most exciting topic. You know, look at my foot. Okay, thank you. Oh, I could think of a lot. <laughs> I could think of a lot of ways to make to to make health health go viral for sure. Um, anyway, but I hear what you're saying. Is as a hospital that's trying to you know you could you could try and do a lot of different things. Grab some of the top health stories that are really 
good oh, for yeah, some of the big, I'm, you know. I'm, I'm but that may not be what I'm you guys want to do. Yeah. Asking, I mean, we know yeah. how to do it. I was just asking in terms yeah. of like the software component and how you feel about that. Are you using a tool right now to manage to no. publish? No. no. Okay. I do everything through Facebook directly. Uh -huh. I schedule everything out into Outlook. Mm -hmm. I then it then gives me a message and then I go and, and, ah. and I do the same for. Everything and it seems to be you know working out, but God forbid if I get hit by a bus or go on vacation. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of you know have my my. Uh, I mean, even though there isn't a holy grail to tool usage for analytics, for publishing content, monitoring content, well, we for creating for Google for ninety percent of our right. stuff. To they measure. did release their social packages past year, so there's a lot of good functionality in there, but. It's so important to have something on your side. And we use our Facebook that you receive. reports every month, and we use our Twitter reports every month, and we post them out to a collaboration site, and mm -hmm. everybody can see them. And, and we really don't have a shortage of that. It was just more of uh, the prevailing, you know, and of course we're dealing with patient health information, so we really aren't really willing to let that go mm -hmm. outside. Mm -hmm. But I just wondered if uh, out there, if anybody, you know, since you're re representing that, if anybody ever said to you, oh, a really great product there, but I'm not going to use the schedule. Yeah, I heard the same thing too, actually, um, as far as in your timeline, they're going to be removing the posted yeah. from. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be removed. And I mean, I think there's been a lot of just sort of general, uh, you know, consternation or unhappiness from some people who do things in, in your style about, about how they can't use a tool that would make their lives a little bit easier because they fear that not as many people will get to see their stuff. I think that sort of indicates some of the issues that the people who run Facebook um, have as far as whether or not they really know much about how social media is really done. But, but um, yeah, that's a story for a different time. But, yeah, so um, forget sort of where, oh, yes, um, brand. So what are some of the things that you would actually want to look for? What are pieces of information? If you're actually searching for information, you're, okay, let's say you get a keyword search together, and here's, here's how we do a keyword search. It's sort of a monitoring tool. Some of you are more familiar with that type of thing than others. But basically what you would do is you would, let's say we, let's say we really care about information around the, uh, the iPad. Okay, so this we'll call this one the iPad. We'll give it a title up there. You get basically 120 characters here to put in some keywords. And once we put in the keywords and save it, we'll actually viral heat. This particular tool will go look for those keywords on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest websites, and YouTube. So um, yeah, we could put iPad here. Obviously, we could put uh, hashtag iPad in quotes. They have to be in quotes whenever there's a funny thing like a hashtag. Uh, we can put in uh, Twitter handles, URLs, so we could do, uh, I don't know if this really exists, but iPad.com uh, right there. Notice how we didn't need the HTTP colon slash slash and all that. You can do phrases uh, such as uh, I love iPad or whatever, you know, something like that. Surprisingly enough, there are a lot of people who say things like that on a regular basis. There's also a lot of people who say iPad sucks, but you could search for those too if you wish. Um, anyway, a lot of different keywords you can put there. Um, we can click Add, and then it would actually show up and be on this left-hand side of the screen right here um, in, in Sources. It would actually go to Sources, which I can get to by clicking on the left-hand side of the screen here, I believe. It should be. Is it? Yeah, it is. It is loading. There we go. So um, I actually do have uh, Apple Computer down here. I can click on it, and it actually uh, delivers me a long stream of all the different things that people are saying on Twitter, Facebook, and all these other different places right here. We've got website mentions. You can click through and you can see where you're being mentioned, whatever your keywords might be, where you're being mentioned. So one of the things that you can look for in here is uh, information about your brand. So let's actually go back to sources real quick. Uh, let's say your brand is Fitbit. Um, there's probably around 300 or 400 different mentions of Fitbit in some fashion every single day. So I'll actually click on Fitbit right here. That'll open up its stream. And I could actually save the stream for Fitbit on the left-hand side here using a, a filter button up here. And there's all sorts of different options here from, from Twitter, Facebook, and all these different guys. But let me clear all here. Let me go to Twitter. Let me uh, scroll down a little and grab Fitbit. Where are you? I'll check mark Fitbit. And let's actually create uh, a way for you to see all the negative things that people are saying about Fitbit. Uh, let's uh, go to sentiment here and click on negative. So right now we've got one Twitter source, and that's Fitbit, uh, showing only negative sentiment. And let's preview what that looks like. We could call this a support stream. If people are saying negative things about your product, you can reach out to them right away um, and talk to them about it. I'm on it. Okay, let's see what else. I need to be up at 5 a.m. Not really anything new, but I'm exhausted and should, should I don't want my Fitbit back? Stupid toilet. Uh, this could be an opportunity to give somebody. So hey, Lil, here, we can uh, pick an account 
Uh, there, I'll pick my account right there, but I'll make sure I don't actually click the reply button. Hey, <laughs> under, we understand that, you know, we see what happened, that's awful, that's horrible. Look, here's a 10% discount link. That's one way you can engage immediately with these people. And you want to make sure that if, and cancel. Oh, uh, wait, no. Uh, am I sure I want to? Yeah, I want to close it. Thanks. Okay, so that, that one, he said that at 22 minutes ago. So this is happening in more or less real time. We update the system about 10 every 10, 15 minutes. Um, if there's an update that comes through on, on whatever the, 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 um, the platform might be, it's going to come through here and you'll see it. So yeah, one thing that did happen to me one time was I was sick. And I take, um, I take these, uh, well, these lozenges, right? But the lozenges upset my stomach. So I said, you know, being grumpy and grouchy, I said, I can't take the lozenges because they're, they, you know, upset stomach. So the actual company that makes the lozenges, I forget what the name of the company is, but they help you not be sick. They're great for the immune system. A lot of zinc in them. Anyway, so... Um, they reach out to me in that exact fashion. Although I know they didn't use viral heat, but they used one of the other tools. And they said, hey, uh, use the, the ones that melt in your tongue. So I, they sent me a link. I went and I bought it, and it arrived two, three days later. So it's, you know, that's, that's how it's done. I mean, there's a lot of different things. I can show you. Let's, see, uh, let's go back to sources and show you some others. I uh, talked to the roofing guys the other day who want to like, track just the tweets within you know, 50 miles of Dallas or any other of the cities that are kind of in the path of hurricanes on a regular basis. And figure out the ones. So uh, storm damage right here was 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 that guy just the other day. He wants to. He's interested in our geo segmentation, where you know you can put a radius around a city and find the the uh, all the different places that had damage. If somebody's tweeting out the damage that they had. So the different characters that we came with up with are roof damage and hail damage, and there might be some others that we come up, come up with at some point. But they want to try and figure out what customers they can find on social media using this. Anyone complaining about roof damage on Twitter, Facebook, or any of the others, they're going to hopefully be able to find them and then reach out to them and help them in some way in real life. Um, all right, so that's another example. I'll show you one final example that, that uh, yeah. Use that, uh, geolocator in reverse. So if you want to find where the conversation is most vibrant about roof damage and you don't know, let's say the whole United States had a tornado, for example, and so we want to find out who got hit worse, the worst. Oh, no, for sure, yeah. I mean, the other way. Yeah, I mean, like you could, so what you would do is you would want to create a keyword search for various locations. Like you would, uh, see, so adding this keyword search in here, you could put in, you know, roof damage right here. And then you could uh, press enter. And then uh, scroll down. Here's the location right down here. And I'll click yes, add a location. It's an enterprise feature, contact, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, once that shows up, you put it within a certain amount of kilometers or miles from uh, some, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, or whatever it may be. And you should have the Nashville, Tennessee one, then you can have one for New Orleans, you can have one for um, Dallas or Houston or whatever, any different city. I'm displaying the fact that I really don't know which cities have the worst um, uh, you know, of these kinds of things. But anyway, the idea is you could create a keyword search for each one and then compare the conversations, the size of the conversations um, in, in the analytics. So one of the things that you can do actually in the tools section right here is you can compare the size of these different keyword searches, the size of the conversations that people are having about different things, which was actually... Uh, that that uh, pie graph that I had up there earlier. So I can, uh, let's see, let's do the compare keyword search tool. And let's see what I actually have in there that I can compare. I have stuff that I can compare. There are two, um, there's Starbucks can compare two of its, uh, let's say I, I gotta have the two Starbucks products here. I have, uh, where are you? People laugh. I've got Frappuccino, which is a technically a Starbucks product, and then Pumpkin Spice Latte, and this is not the Pumpkin Spice Latte time of year, let me tell you. So generate report. And then you can see, okay, so this is a long explanation, but there's not much data on Wednesday yet in this graph for whatever reason, and that's because it's looking at, at, uh, at Wednesday and we're not on Wednesday, but the, this tool goes off GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. So anyway, uh, you can see Pumpkin Spice Latte only had 41 mentions in the world yesterday on Tuesday, on the social world, whereas Frappuccino had 885. It's, it's kind of much more even. They're usually like... Frappuccino, uh, you know, for like the three months out of the year, October, November, December, um, Frappuccino is like 45 and pumpkin spice latte is like 55 and it's actually higher. So th this is the time of year when pumpkin spice, no one pay, pays any attention to it. So that's the kind of uh, thing that you can do. Uh, pretend in your mind like this could be the conversation around roof damage in Dallas and this could be the conversation around roof damage in Austin. And so yeah, there could be a tremendous difference and that's one way that you'd be able to tell. Um, so yeah, uh, one last thing, and then I'll and then I'll shut up about all all of these different um, ways that you can measure stuff 
and, and uh, figure stuff out on the fly as you're going each day, uh, is uh, uh, iPhone battery low. So one of the iPhone batteries uh, that's out there that is a, you take it along with, you, you charge it just like you charge a phone, you take it along and then you attach it to the iPhone later on. It's one of those. It's called Mophie. Talk to those guys and they wanted to do a stream for anytime anybody says my iPhone battery is low so that they can encourage those people in real time to, hey, check out Mophie. So let's actually click on iPhone battery low. And some of the keywords are iPhone battery sucks. So there is a, but a lot of people say that. There's like 500 people a day saying iPhone battery low. Well, what are they saying? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You have to have the SUX, you have to have the SUCK. Anyway, but, but so yeah, it's here. And uh, there's some other swear words. I apologize for that. But yeah, so you can sort of see what's going on here. Sucks is a little bit more popular than iPhone battery low, but we do get a lot of iPhone battery low, always low here. And we've got it set up so it doesn't have to be in that exact order. You can have is always in there and it will still pick it up through your keywords that you pick out. And so what can you do there? You quickly just click reply, you pick your account, there it is, and you say, hey, sorry that you're having trouble. You know, if you had Mophie, you'd read more about it here. So that, that kind of thing uh, is, is sort of the So that's one of the things, the whole point is there's confusion in, in the marketing world sometimes about what am I looking for when I look at this massive data. This type of stuff, these types of things are stuff you can, you can look for. You can look for leads, you can look for positive, negative stuff, you can look for um, information about your brand, you can look for marketing messaging, things like this. If you're a car dealership, you can be looking for people complaining about a about, uh, problem with the, with the whatever, with the tire, with the axle, with the I don't know what. And then you can, you can reach right back out to them and say, hey, check us out, we have a deal going this month. That kind of thing. Um, and then, so that's that. I'm just gonna, I know how to use my own website just great. Okay, so back over here, let's actually do this final thing and it's a case study. Um, and there you go, that's the button. Okay, it's case studies to lead into your case study, right? Um, so this is our men's warehouse case study. It's very retail oriented. Um, there's a thing at the top talking about what men's warehouse is, which, um, yeah, there it is. And so you know all that, more or less. Um, it's based in Texas, too. I forgot which city in Texas. But anyway, so 18 months ago, here's how they used Viral Heat to grow their, you know, what they did that helped them grow their, their, their followers. So 18 months ago, they had a combined following on Pinterest, Google+, Facebook, Twitter, of just 4,000 uh, people. They used our monitoring feature to track mentions of them. Uh, they tracked the word tuxedo. That was one of the keyword searches that they use to see conversations. Um, and then immediately engage and talk with the teachers. And so when there was, um, excuse me, when they, uh, they, so they used the detailed analytics to measure the number of likes uh, for a 1999 uh, tie sale uh, for two, you know, 262. And then they measured the percentage of mentions changing a, a week over week. And they also uh, measured um, the, the percentage of, uh, they also compared it to previous campaigns. So they were able to sort of see which ones were working and which tactics were working. Um, so in the last 18 months, they've grown 75 times. Now they have more than 300,000 across those four, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, and Google+. So that is uh, a brief, quick walkthrough of, of, our, of our case study. Any questions on anything? Yeah? You know, on the geolocator, yes. how specific do you get with the location and what data do you use? Yeah, so we, we grab the geo... So primarily, it just it's working with Twitter right now, but we do want to add Facebook in the future because Facebook does have that information. But um, the interesting thing about Twitter is people may say that they live in Texas or whatever, but that's not the actual information that you can get, or it, that our, we can get using their 1.1 algorithm, not to get uh, to their 1.1 API, um, not to get too technical, but we're not able to get all their information. We're only able to get the information that people give them, give them when they give their latitude, longitude, when they actually tell Twitter, hey, I am at Austin, Texas. So the number of people who actually do that is like 1% to 2% of all the people on Twitter. So you can end up with a lot in some situations, but you also end up with not as many. And so it's, uh, it's clearly a tool that uh, a lot of people want, and so um, it's one that we're just continuing to try and improve. But yeah, so we get it, we get it from Twitter, and like 98% of the people actually don't give the exact latitude, latitude longitude of where they're located. That's the deal with the geolocation. And the way, the way it actually works is, if I was able to go in there and actually show it to you is, you could actually pick Vancouver and then you could pick uh, 400 miles radius or, or 300 miles or 500 miles, all that stuff. Any other questions on anything? Yeah? Just curious, what's the time frame? Oh, this one was about 18 months. That was uh, from 18 months ago till now. 
They're actually, um, I don't have it on here, but they're actually in like the top 300, I think Forbes or some, some, uh, some publication came up with the social media 300 brands and they were like 247 or something. So they're really happy and have made big strides. So I think, I think again, the thing is day in and day out, constant, not constant, but you know, those of us who do this for a living, you know, you're spending a lot of time doing this and it's a, it's a layer of your life that's just part of things. Any, any other questions? Was it, um, was it just by engaging in mean, conversation or, or what else did they do with so, that? Yeah, I, I think so. They had some. Con I know that there were multiple contests and multiple sales, and then there were various uh, sort of uh, promotions that they ran around that um, with people online. I'm not sure the exact details on that, but I, but when you were talking, when Brian was talking about uh, some of the stuff that you did with the lottery, um, it, it reminded me of a similar situation that that they were in. I think it's one of those things where there has to, you have to incentivize people to want to have fun and by having fun also doing something along the way that helps you whatever whatever it may be so it's it's a, it's it's a it's a different kind of it's a different kind of marketing um, but it's it's um one that's really sort of starting to become more and more a layer of what what people are working on um, in the world today so yeah yeah go i'd for be it. happy to get up and give a the kind of a case study of how we utilize social media to extend our advertising budget that was kind of a problem we had how we did it a little bit guerrilla style and then how that transitioned into a small paid campaign and then provide examples on how we use that data to uh, do our Powerball campaign. If that's something. Yep. Okay. Please do. I think I got it back there. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to try to speak then a little bit more to how we did, how we initially pulled data before we had a tool, because we actually only brought our tool on board in December after doing a five bid process. So we're just coming a little bit, becoming a little bit familiar with its capabilities. And yes, there is no holy grail that can publish content, monitor and listen, produce promotions for you, do robust analytics. So uh, it, there's still a lot that we're doing manually. So I can talk through a little bit of how we did this manually, how we pulled data that actually got budget. Um, if your objective is eventually to convince senior management or, or management to um, give you a little, throw, throw some bones your way. Um, so the problem is, one of the major problems that we have uh, at all times is that we have a limited advertising budget. Resources are, are scarce. Uh, and there's not enough value in social media marketing to put dollars towards it. Or there's not enough um, understanding of social media and the value of it to put dollars towards it. So. Um, we really only had to use our own media channels, as I initially talked about. The social media was one of our own media cha channels. Um, when we started off, we had our Facebook analytics. Let me go ahead and... It's in here somewhere. So, right, we all have access to this. Right, your insights, right? Your, your, your dashboard on Facebook. Um, and so this is primarily where all of the data came from. In addition to using some free sources um, of information about the uh, Twitter growth. Um, and I can show you some examples of that, but let's just start with Facebook since 68% of the public utilizes uh, Facebook and it's the behemoth of all the social media channels. It kind of just started here and um, some of our strategic goals are to reach certain uh, age and gender demographics. So in terms of that, I really just started by exporting data and then in Excel, right? Tactically, I'm going to try to talk through this tactically, exporting this data in Excel. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot of information in those Excel spreadsheets. And I sat down and I had a good two hour talk with my uh, Facebook guy and went through each and every line. They don't even know all of the data that's in there. There's a lot of stuff. So I had to start pulling out the information that I needed. And I actually decided that going through the spreadsheet wasn't really helpful unless I was doing annual comparisons, quarterly comparisons. So for the month to month sort of things, I actually started just taking pictures and screenshots of where my demographics were. So this is currently where we were. When we started off, our 1834 demographic was much smaller than our 3444 demographic that you see here. 
Um, and, you know, we have an aging demographic, uh, an aging playership in the, the lottery. Um, and so one of our objectives is to engage people more. So the base, first thing was to really kind of set the baseline on where we are, what we're doing. We started off with about 30,000 fans uh, of May last year. Uh, and then that one degree of separation, their friends and family, that one initial ring and the rippling effect of social media, right? The one, if every single person that was a fan of my site interacted with what one piece of content, that one ring that I would reach uh, was about 80,000. Um, and so we wanted to obviously improve the size of our fan base, but also improve the size of our one degree of separation social network. Um, as, as well as uh, bringing in some more of the millennial demographic and the 13, 13 sorry, 34 and under demographic. Um, so the strategy that we basically use in all cases, regardless of what we're doing, uh, the strategy is always the same, um, right? Because we start with this objective we need to, ex or the goal of extending the reach of our limited advertising budget. The strategy is always the same. Engage and optimize. Engage and optimize. It doesn't matter if I'm on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, doesn't matter what social platform I'm on, the strategy is always the same. Engage and optimize, and it's a repeating process. Um, so that's what we essentially did. Uh, our speak, the way we speak on the internet used to be very um, marketing focused. Buy our product. This just came out. Go to the store. Find a retailer near you. And it wasn't at all a dialogue. It was a one-way communication. Uh, it was a one-way conversation. We weren't responding to people. Uh, we weren't replying, we weren't, in, we weren't rewarding positive behavior, we weren't liking comments, liking people that were answering questions for us, our internal evangelist. So we set out on a strategy to do a couple of things, which included, um, tactically, which included, we really wanted to build a community. So within our page, we actually kind of provide community guidelines on what the expected co conduct is. Here is a little bit about the mission in general. But we wanted to welcome them. We posted this on the site. Whenever anyone pushes our logo, they see welcome to the page, welcome to our community. This is what we're all about. We also additionally then provide guidelines and conduct in our about section and information to learn more. If you use the site for wrong purposes, we will kick you off of it. Uh, we actually get people who grab that content now and repost it for us. The community started to work for us when we started to implement some of these uh, tactics. Um, so creating a sense of community. Second thing we did after trying to create this sense of community with the uh, native features of Facebook is that we built that into the communication on our public website. So on everywhere that you see a Facebook logo on the lottery site, with the exception of the home page, you'll see join the conversation. We gave the platform purpose. Facebook is for conversation. We as marketers know that, right? We know that already, but we can't expect not the... We can't expect the layman to know that. We can't expect their users to just know that. So we wanted to start directing them to the right place. Join the conversation on Facebook. Find more information on Twitter. Jackpot amounts, press releases, uh, winter awareness stuff. Watch us on YouTube. Video, just there's video on YouTube. So we had to establish a purpose. So now when you go to the site, we say exactly what you're gonna find where to give each of these properties purpose in their mind. We already know what they're for, but they don't know what they're for. They don't know what they're gonna find. So if they wanna watch something, Instead of going to Hulu, check out our, our YouTube page. Those are really well organized. We actually have um, a different number, a, sub, a number of playlists based on the type of content. We have a playlist called uh, Players Winners Lounge, Players Lounge, which parallels the name of our uh, e-newsletter. And that's all about new games. And that's all about um, who's winning, where they're winning. And we have one on uh, Mission is Message. That's all around our beneficiary messaging, education, schools, and we have one on integrity, kind of showing the back behind the scenes of how our draws work um, and how the process works. So, one, we created a community. Two, we gave a, we gave the site's purpose and, and kind of directed people there, and we had to tell them specifically what those were for. Um, another thing that we really did is we wanted to use real rapid responses. It used to take us about two days three days to get back to people that would send us messages. And as I mentioned, uh, we don't have customer service on the weekends, so if someone's having an issue trying to enter their information or interact with our site on something that's got a deadline, we have a number of draws uh, that have a deadline, it creates a very negative customer experience. So we've been able to change that by providing um, real and rapid response. The real part of that phrase, real rapid response, is that we want to start talking like a human being. 
we kind of were talking like marketers. We wanted to start to be a friend. Um, and so we have actually gotten to the, so what we've done is started to identify our most active users, which you don't necessarily need a tool to use. If you're on there all the time, you know who's posting all the time. You know who's up at 3 a.m. on the site. Uh, you know who, who your site is their life. We'll say that. I'm not going to say they don't have life. I'm just going to say your site is their life. Um, so we wanted to be real and start to talk to them like a friend, and now we actually acknowledge them by name. One of the things that we've done on the real side, too, is that we've called them. We've kind of created a, a beta test group for anything that we do. If we want to run some questions by some of our most loyal uh, users. We essentially just, um, since you can't message your users on Facebook, we would respond to their comments and tell us to message them. And we would start a conversation in the message field. And they would give us their real name. And they would give us their email address and their phone number. Um, and I've called them on occasions. Uh, this group of, uh, I call them beta users because we kind of use them as a testing group. Um, but they're just good to talk about what's going on the page, going on in the page and going on in the community and what they want to see in the community. They're kind of my own focus group. Um, and what I've done for them is I've invited them for, to exclusive uh, opportunities. We launched Powerball in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Sacramento. Those people received special invitations to come out uh, and be there. And they, knowing the nature of who they are, we didn't ask them. It wasn't an exchange for coverage of the events, but they naturally did that. They took pictures and just innately um, started building the community with us. So I actually would recommend if you have super users, get to know them because the, my group of five people, um, they answer questions faster than I do. They pull more information than I do. You know, your page, your wall space is limited. You can't post as much information on Facebook as you can in, in Twitter, right? You can put just about any type, piece of content you want on Twitter, but you really want to be very um, pointed in your, in, your, in your posts on Facebook and stick to your content calendar. And there is a little bit of debate about how many times a day you can post. What's the optimal number of posts in the day? Um, I hear it's around two. I've heard one. I've heard three. I think it really does matter. I think it's based on your brand and what type of what kind of interaction your people want. Mine are very <coughs> entertainment focused, so I think we get a little bit of leeway. We can do two to three. Um, but really building this community, and I actually took the conversation offline to be real with them. So I would recommend building that group. They'll become very, very valuable and even tremendously more loyal to your brand when there's a voice tied to them. Um, so real, uh, rapid in terms of response. We now respond to everything in 24 hours. And then the dialogue. Um, we went from posting outwardly to I have, a, I have brought this up for us. Where is it? So in our threads, there's a new feature on Facebook that allows you to reply directly to one individual comment. Has anyone seen this? Yeah, it's really cool. There used to be a chat function or a discussion board function that got removed when Timeline came, by, uh, came, came on board. But now it actually creates a chat room, a, a chat room or, or a discussion board within a particular thread. It's awesome. Um, it's awesome because you can directly respond to people and create mini threads and have mini dialogue in addition to responding to people way lower in the thread. So there are a number of more miniature and micro conversations that you can have as a result of this reply function if you're not using it. I highly suggest you use it because it really kind of now functions as a discussion board. Um, I wanted to show an example of it, but here's a good example. Um, good example of the type of dialogue, just social, I guess it's not, I say social, but we ask a lot of questions and we try to make it less about the product and more about just a feeling. So here we're talking about Powerball. Um, do you dream of winning Powerball? What would you do if you won? Share your CA dream with us. And uh, this leads to an engagement uh, experience. We've started to add a number of engagement experiences, which are difficult to do if you don't have budget. Um, so I could talk, uh, I'll kind of, I mentioned earlier two promotions we did that were guerrilla style and really helped generate budget. Um, so I would recommend trying to do something similar to those. But going back to my point of replying in the threads, you can see here that I don't even want to know what's there. Who knows? Hold on a second. <laughs> Hold on a second. You never know. Those little dot, dot, dots. <laughs> um, I didn't bring this one up for that example, but there I have a really great example of just replying a lot in one thread. Um, it's tedious work. It's busy work. Um, you know, you really have to have a community manager who gets the value of it and loves to have micro-conversations. 
Um, one of the things we also maintain, we always do, we always stay positive. We never go negative. Never negative on social media, even your own pages, because uh, it's tied to your brand. Um, so we always stay positive. We get a lot of negativity. <laughs> um, there's a lot of misconceptions about um, our product, and there's some people just don't like the activity of gambling in general, and we understand that. Um, so we take action to um, try to, deal, to work with people to an extent. Um, oh, we're sorry you feel this way. Uh, our objective is to generate revenue for this, and in fact, this is what we've actually done. Um, if we get other negative comments, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of turn it into, hey, what do other people think? And those five people always speak up. What do you guys think about this? Hey, Lydia, you know, this person really doesn't think that gambling should exist in California. What do you think? Well, I do it and she'll say, you know, I'll do, I do it for entertainment. Some people like to go to casinos. Some people like to go out dancing. Some people like fancy dinners. I like to play the lottery for fun. So um, we, don't, we, we never go negative and we leverage our, our, our core users to, um, we leverage our core users to kind of combat any sort of negativity. Um, so other things we did to kind of extend the reach of our limited advertising budget, we implemented these, these tactics. Tactically, before I had a tool, I would just go into my insights and literally on a weekly basis in an Excel spreadsheet go to this page. It's a beautiful page. And I can look at my reach. I can look at my virality. And I can look at my engaged users. And I track each and every one of them and determined what worked and didn't work. I looked at subject matter. I looked at content type, video, pictures. Um, content type being, is it a general post? Did I ask a question? Was it an engagement kind of question? Like, the news of the day is this, or how are you feeling? Was it specific to a product? Um, I looked at content, content on a deeper level. If I'm using pictures, are pictures of cars working? Are pictures of houses working? Are pictures of sanded beaches working? Um, are pictures of families working? And I tracked it all. I tracked it all just by making marks of what the top three types of content, uh, types of pictures, types of videos, uh, how they performed. And without having to actually use the tool, I, we've been able to drill, drill in really, really well into what works well. I'll say this, my learnings there are one, always use a picture. Picture for us works better than video even does. We, thank you. Uh, we, all, we all always use a picture no matter what, um, and that could spread more than anything video. Uh, works well for us on YouTube, but not here. Um, so you can really pull a lot of insight out of this directly. If you go in on a weekly basis and track on a, on a, on a, on a week to week basis, what's working, what's not working by looking at the things that rank at the top three under reach, engaged users and virality. Very, very helpful. Now we've utilized content and, uh, excuse me, we've optimized our content and um, after running the promotions with the um, Adventure Pet campaign where we asked people to send pictures of our, their pets and showed that we were able to bring it, their 30% of those people were non-loyalists and that we were able to market to them and we developed this valuable marketing list, having uh, email list, having received their email addresses, we're able to do more engagement campaigns and we started to get a little bit of money for promotions. First it was just some product and then it was a couple of dollars in product and now it's a lot of dollars and now it's, you know, Vendors, we have vendors to help us with these things. So some of our best engagement things we've been able to do as a result of things that started very small, right, very guerrilla style, are things like this. So this is a microsite. Uh, we call it the Believe Microsite, where people can come and share their dreams. It's just about dreaming. It's not about the product. And so people come in and talk about what they want to do with their CA dreams, California dreams, by tweeting. And we found that this is actually taking off really well. We never knew how it was going to work. If you put your own Twitter uh, handle in there, you'll be able to see your own. I'm trying to find one of mine. Here they are. I don't know if you guys can see those, but these are now all built into all of our campaigns. That one says Mario Lopez. There's a really funny one in here. I can't find it. But we built this into all of our campaigns. Engagement is now... What's that? I'm, what are we looking at? Oh, we're looking at an engagement, uh, an engagement microsite. Engagement experiences are now built into everything we do as a result of our success with the smaller campaigns that we've done. And that's how we've gotten budget. Um, so this is a website where people can go on Twitter, use hashtag CA Dream, and say what they would do if they won Powerball. 
Um, but for the for this for for that matter, they can say what they would do if they want any amount of money for that matter, or what the general dream in California is. Um, and it's just a fun way to engage our brand and interact with our brand. So that's one fun thing. If you if you um, go to Twitter, use hashtag CA Dream, and then you go to CA Lot or Dream .ca Lottery .com, you'll see your dreams here. You can look at your friends' dreams. But engagement is in everything we do now. Done a song contest recently as part of the Powerball campaign. We've invited people in California, 18 plus, to sing a song, make, create their own rendition of um, California Dreamin' for a chance to perform live uh, and win, win a $5,000 prize. Um, people loved the voting feature. People loved the videos. We had a great one. I thought he was amazing, Tambourine Man, and he just did jumping jacks and like, smash the tambourine together. I thought it was hilarious. I totally got where he was coming from. But we got a much better act. <laughs> it was really funny. Uh, we got a much better act uh, as a result that, that kind of just won um, from the campaign. But I encourage you to look at that. It's a fun thing. But we're, what I'm really going at here is that as a result of everything started with going into insights, identifying under reach, engage users, and virality, what content type worked best what types of pictures worked best, what type of questions worked best. Um, then I exclusively started to use those types of questions and then tested in my content calendar different things on Sundays usually because people are home and you get a lot of volume on that day. So I would test new things on Sundays, but Monday through Saturday I would use tried and true uh, tactics that came out of really just pulling data manually from this. Um, as a result of everything we've done, I guess with that, that added to engagement, that added to, the, to our fan growth and our engagement, that led to doing small promotions with no budget whatsoever that were manually done in a big headache, uh, which led to showing value and bringing in people who weren't part of our loyalty program, which led to getting a little bit of money to try a real promotion, which led to a full-blown promotion, which led to marketing dollars and a full-blown promotion. And now we do full-blown promotions, engagement pages, and invest marketing dollars. So it all started with this little page, and it, and it really has grown as a result. So I just kind of wanted to show an example of that tactically. I'd like to open the floor up for questions. Questions. Comments? Similar situations? Go ahead. I have a very specific question. Yeah. I'm also in state social media presence okay. <laughs> and um, you mentioned the weekend mm -hmm. coverage so what staff is handling that mm -hmm. is it on call is it also week nights yep. or is it just weekends um so looking into this so. yes so uh i'm sure you have a pr office yeah. so social media is housed in a weird way under our corporate communication so it's kind of in our pr office but it's also in sales and marketing um, so we do com com commit an, the person that's on staff over the weekend is responsible for at least checking the page and answering questions in the message box. Um, subsequently, yours truly, <laughs> um, I also check. And so there, I, I do a lot of micromanaging of it, but uh, we do put the person who's on call for press calls and things of that sort, we give them the responsibility of, of checking the page to answer questions. So it used to be two to three days. And so what do you target now as far as a response? 24 hours. Yeah, 24 hours or less. Um, 24 hours or less, yeah. Usually on the weekends it takes a little bit of time. That's why we're 24 hours comes in. But we we're pretty much down to like 10 tops at the, at the latest what's 10 your, hours. What's how big is your staff? Um, my social media staff? Two people. Oh, man. I'm getting three more, but two people right now. So. Full-time social media? Well, my one person who's, I'm full-time digital, so I don't just do social media. I'm building campaigns and things like that. But um, we have no one person who's 100% committed to social media, but we will be onboarding people soon. So if you're looking for jobs, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Any other similar experiences? Yeah. Well, going off of what you said, if, you know, I'm a student who's interested in breaking into the social media Field as a career. So, what advice would you give to someone that is looking to break in? I think it's. I think this is a great space for students to break in, um, because the expectation at management level, we're not as intimately involved in social media 
is that, oh, we don't really need to you know, outsource that. We don't need to invest a lot of dollars. It's, it's a position where you can get in at an entry level and add a lot of value if you can use your data the right way. If you can understand your data and then understand what the, what the organization is measuring, that's the first thing I did. How, how, are, how are we measuring what's important? Okay, dollars, I get that. I can't prove dollars. Okay, well, how are we measuring marketing? Impressions, reach, right? Total, total unique impressions. So then I started to basically tie my social media data to the metrics that we used in marketing, and I correlated. I got, if we spend uh, $50,000 and we get 1.5 million, uh, 1.5 million unique, um, unique visitors. Unique visitors. We'll use that for an example to the website. And I deliver the same amount via social media, and we know these are people, I can track to see if these people are fans. I, in my own justification, and maybe not everyone buys this, think that I have just generated $50,000 $50, of value. Goes back to that cost benefit, right? I've saved this, the money that we would have had to invest otherwise to drive that traffic there by utilizing our own media asset. So if you can get in, understand the language of ROI and the value, and speak that to them and in, their own, in their own words, you can be very powerful. I don't think that they really had an expectation that that was going to happen. <laughs> and also you have to do the groundwork yourself as far as building your own uh, your followings. Yeah. You have to try out every tool. You have to check it all. You probably already are doing this, but check out Pinterest, check out Instagram, make it a part of your life, figure out the ones that you like the most and that are your favorites. Uh, talk to people, make friends with yeah, I would definitely recommend spending a lot of time on Google Plus or spending a lot of time on Facebook. Like, it's probably already so addictive. You want to do that? Maybe like concentrate on always going back to G Plus if you spend uh, so much time on Twitter and you're kind of sick and tired of it. But yeah, uh, or not Twitter, but Facebook and you're sick and tired of it. But yeah, go to Twitter as well. Check them all out. Get to know people. Talk to people. Go to events like this. Seems like you're, you know, probably in the right direction. And when you interview, speak marketing ROI, not social ROI. It's not about fans and likes. It's about impressions. It's about click-through rates to the website. Speak in their language and try to you know, spend time with the marketing, marketing, just marketing analytics, marketing, you know, how ROI is measured in marketing, and try to find ways to correlate all of the different platforms and the activity that goes on there into how they talk about marketing. Definitely take some marketing classes. Get an MBA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Easier said than done. Yeah. So, uh, quick question. Um, brand new at a nonprofit, coming from the TV world, and it was really easy for, for me from TV saying, you know, you like us on Facebook, you know, like just by a quick five second ad. And I've been trying to grow um, the, the fan page and the Twitter following and the Pinterest and the Instagram and everything all at the same time. It's like, how can you divide your time to do it all? and then grow your likes, and I've only seen um, maybe like a two percentage growth in a, in a month, and I'm like, oh my God, that can't happen to me, because it used to grow so much when I was on, you know, when I had my other platforms, and if you don't, you know, I put it on my, my personal page, mm -hmm. but like how can you grow when you don't have, you know what I mean? Your time is valuable. You can't do it all. Start with one platform that's got the best penetration, right? You know your people are, depending if, I mean, I guess it depends on you're in a nonprofit. Yeah. So I would say start with the biggest platform. I would always recommend to start with Facebook because it has a 68% usage rate mm -hmm. um, in the United States. Yeah, is, there, is there one for you that uh, really sales above the others? Facebook. Facebook. Okay. But see, when I ask questions, I get, I even use the, the, the you know, like when you can create, like when you can actually have them add options for the answers. Mm -hmm and I get one response. And I'm like, Redirect your time that you're spending on your other social platforms and really just start to do one well because those people that when you cultivate that community on Facebook, they're gonna look for you on other platforms. They're gonna follow you from platform to platform. So don't spread yourself too thin putting too much work. Just really try to focus on Facebook. Build a content calendar. Determine from the perspective of the consumer what's interesting to them, what's emotionally engaging, um, things of that sort, and then yeah, it sometimes it takes a while to just get it started, yeah. asking questions and um, things of that sort. Do you have budget too? Do you have anything yeah. to play with? No. Okay. Yeah. And it's all you by yourself. Yes. I would say uh, two to three posts a day on Facebook, okay. and then uh, 
you want to try and go for eight to ten on Twitter or something along those lines and just okay. shoot it out there. Okay. And you know, get to know people. But don't the tweets don't, don't just people that follow you on Twitter get the tweets? Are they gonna be like, oh my god, I'm tired of this? No, no. Well, that medium no. is kind of you're used to just a stream of information. No. But when you do get that one response on Facebook, talk back to them. Okay. Yeah. Immediately. <laughs> Start a conversation. It may just be the two of you. <laughs> to what extent are you talking to people unsolicited who you don't know quite as well? Uh, you know, you, to what extent are you just talking to other people and not concentrating on your own stuff? I, I would advocate that you spend the majority of the time doing that. Yeah. Then the rest might come easier, too. I know you had a question, and then Laura. I just, I just have kind of a follow-up as also a small nonprofit that uh, one, one of the things that I asked our, everyone who worked at our nonprofit to do was to share our page with, with all their friends. And we actually, we did that like over a weekend and got like 100 new likes. Awesome. They just never thought to share it with mm -hmm. their friends. Mm -hmm. And then also everywhere that we send stuff out to people, we, did, <coughs> we do a lot of email marketing, including our um, link to Facebook yeah. and why you might want to go there has helped. Yeah. Same thing, yeah, it's to, that, to that end, mm -hmm. put your bugs everywhere, your Facebook and Twitter bugs everywhere. Mm -hmm. Link to it, put content down there. I know that you had a question. Yeah. No, oh, sorry. A little off topic, but I haven't been able to get an answer on anyone. It's a promoted yeah. post. Uh oh. <laughs> what happened to their policy? Like they, something changed now they reject anything, no matter what the content is. Ah. What the image is like, I haven't done that. There's a whole bunch of things, right? So there's all of these things going on with promoted posts. Um, promoted posts are essentially the ones that you pay to show up in other people's news feeds or the ones that you pay to show up on the right hand column. This was incredible for a while. Oh yeah, it was really great. And now there's a thing where only 20% of the image you post can have actual text in it because people were, well first it started with the status, whatever your status update was, couldn't be marketing speak, right? They were very specific about what it said. You couldn't be talking about a promotion or something like that. And then they got very, so people started putting it in the image. They would just put text in the image. Well now the image, only 20% of the image can actually have text in it, so that's limited too. Um, I have found those to be very valuable by asking questions. I'm essentially thinking, I'm casting a net to a broad audience. I'm just gonna ask a question that anyone can answer. What would you do if you won $40 million? Right, but I mean, I've tried just text and just a status update. Yeah. They reject everything. What's your brand? Uh, it's a restaurant bar. I'd be curious about your content because I do a lot of promoted posts. So and I'm, I tried without talking about alcohol. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure what to make of it, to be honest with you. Can we look at it? Yeah. Maybe it's you. <laughs> just like, no, I'm serious. No, you can have a blacklist for time. But he would know. And, and okay. get in a live body. I would. Because it really does sound like he's blacklisted, just categorically. Just like yeah. I work with the statewide association and we have all these separate um, pages for each of our regions, which most of them have very few fans. And we're thinking about switching back to the statewide level. Um, and yet, there's a need to have a little bit of localized conversation. Um, are there other ways of doing that? Um, yeah, so, you know, it, whenever you create a page and you build fan base there, you want to be able to maintain those people. You don't want to take an effort to shut down the page and, and try to drive them, right? Push them to another page. But if you're getting really, really, really low traffic and it's just not panning out, um, there's a be beautiful new feature on Facebook that allow you to do geolocated posts. You can do uh, language and gender look, uh, targeted posts. So, um, you know, I, I guess it'd be very, I would really spend some time assessing if it's worthwhile to shut down your local pages because you already have built fan base and there's no guarantee they're going to follow you to the state page as much as you try to tell them to go there. But when you are on the state page, if you want to have local dialogue, all you have to do is do a geolocated post and you can have a dialogue just in that area that you're looking at. How many uh, pages are we talking about? Um, 10 pages. So 10 pages and then what kind of staff do you have? Just you? Yeah, yeah, that's a tough one. But she's mighty. Yeah, <laughs> but how much time do you have to be able to do it? Apparently not enough. <laughs> right. Just, um, it, it's a you could, of my Yeah, I mean, you could use a, a tool to, some other options include using a tool to send out to some of those pages, right. like clumps, well, groups. So we've been doing, we have this suite, and we have this as well. 
Yeah. Also hiring an intern. Yeah. I guess you're right. Sure. Or even not summer. Or even not summer. Yeah. Or whatever. So you can kind of target by location. So I just kind of put a post up. Talk to her. Maybe she's interested. <laughs> <laughs> the news of the day is blank stop in, and this would post exclusively to stop in. I would post it. Yeah, so that, that is one of the. So you can have local yeah. conversations within your main page now. Yep. Any good tool out there should be able to provide that for you as well. So. Thank you both very much. I'm going to be running back up to, to close, and the conversation can continue on this channel. Uh, in a moment, we have uh, the drawing to take place after Ronnie speaks. So get your tickets ready. Ronnie. Well, how about a round of applause for Ryan Petit Frere and John Boynton? I like the applause part. An applause for our program director, Shelly King. If you're on the leadership team of the Social Media Club Sacramento or you volunteer with